That's one advantage to getting old, is people wait on you. Like this, like that. Yeah. Is that better? You might want it uncomfortably close. Oh, okay. That's too much. Can you hear me? Okay. It's almost time to start. It is. Well, no one shows up on time, so we have to wait <laughs> past the time we say we're going to start because no one ever is on time. It's fashionably late. There's still people, still some people that are coming in. And so, Fred, if you look to your right here, you're going to see the presentation. And I'll be oh. asking you some questions about the works that are on view. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll just kind of have it structured like we talked about. I got um, it. Okay. We have about we have about nine slides. Mm -hmm. So we can talk for about five minutes each or so. Yeah. For each what? How many are there? Nine. Huh? Nine slides. Nine. Yeah. Okay. Based on the images that we selected. Some of these things, huh? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Who's the, who's the lady sitting over here by Christina? That's Luann. That's, that's my boss. That's Luann. Yeah. I've never met her. Well, well, we'll make sure that changes. to wet your whistle, we have some water down here. Oh, good. Just make the signal, I'll get it for you. That's fine. Thank you, Jesse. We we checked we checked uh, Fred's, but is mine okay? Hey. Yeah. Okay. Who is this? Mate. It's Mate. I'll be done. It's wonderful to see you.
Yeah, all right. So I, I think uh, I think we'll get started as a, a few people kind of filter into the room. Matt, is that all right? All right. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming. Um, I'd also like to thank AOC Community Media for recording this as well as live streaming this today. Uh, the tremendous community asset and the second time I bumped into them this week doing their work. So thank you. Um, I, I want to also thank Fred Packard for being here tonight to speak with me. We're going to discuss his his career both as an educator and an artist. I'm, I'm really excited to have this and I'm going to give you just a little bit of information about him because I think we're going to cover a lot during this particular conversation. Fred is a Louisiana native. Um, he's a visual artist, a filmmaker, and a seminal figure within the Department of Visual Arts here on campus at the, Lu at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And uh, researching this, I came across his 1989 artist statement, and I thought I would read that. It's very short, it's, it's good. My art is deep rooted in nature, and much of it springs from my childhood in the country. Lately, I've dealt with the rhythms I find in nature, its forms, harmonies, and chaos, symmetry and asymmetry. Photography is the medium I'm currently using to discover and explore these possibilities. I just, I really like it. It's well written and short and specific and open-ended. It's wonderful. Um, and then uh, also in terms of having your work seen, the many venues that have exhibited your work, Fred, and for those of you in attendance, are the Akron Art Museum, America House in Munich, Germany, the Contemporary Art Center, New Orleans, New Orleans Academy of Fine Arts, and Louisiana Bon Ami, Maison de Radio, France, in uh, Paris, France. Um, and his films were also regularly screened on Louisiana public television, so some of you may have grown up watching them. Um, and, and you were a long, long serving faculty member here at UL, which we already covered. That must be somebody else. <laughs> I've checked. It was definitely you, Fred. Um, and, and, I, and I thought that just to give a, we, we would start our conversation just noting a work of art that's not yours, that a friend of yours took. Um, in France, uh, your portrait here that's on the screens. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to photography in the service? Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know anything about photography. My, all my schooling was... Uh, either initially in engineering, in which I got out of, I didn't like that. And, um, but it came in handy later. Um, and art, and I bounced around among several universities and, uh, and decided finally to go to LSU. Um, and, uh, I'm strictly in uh, in art. I had no experience with photography, but um, being kind of flighty, I guess. When I got in my junior year, I uh, decided I was tired of school already. Didn't want to stay, so I got out bounced around a while, and um, when you do that, in the 1950s, you lose your deferment from the Army, which I did. So uh, I decided to go back in the fall, September, and went back to LSU and, and uh, put my clothes in the closet in uh, Hatcher Hall, I think it was, paid my um, my dues and uh, somebody came down the hall we didn't have phones in the in the dorms somebody came down the hall and said um, 
uh, anybody named Packard here? And I said, well, I, I qualify for that. And um, you, you're on, on the phone. You have a phone call. So I answered the phone, and my mother said, son, you have uh, a message here in a brown envelope. And uh, she said, it's from the U.S. government. And I said, well, read it to me. So she read it to me. And it was an invitation uh, to join the Army. And uh, <laughs> kind of unexpected. And I said, uh, I said, I'm not supposed to go in the Army. I only have one eye. I only have one eye. And uh, I have two eyes, but only see in one. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I lost, I lost the left when, vision when I was a little kid. Well, they they said uh, when I got to the uh, induction center, I said I, I'm not supposed to be here uh, because I only have one eye. And they said, uh, Oh well, they've changed the rules on that. And. If you have 20-20 vision in your good eye, and you still, you don't have a glass eye, you still have uh, an eye in the socket, uh, there's no problem. Uh, but you'll never go overseas, and you'll never bear arms. And I said, well, okay. And I was ready for a change. I was tired of, tired of school. But a curious thing happened about four or five months later. I was on a troop ship heading for Europe. And shortly after that, I was running around with an M1 rifle on my shoulder. So they don't tell the truth. <laughs> they don't tell the truth. And uh, turned out that this, uh, what appeared to be a negative experience, was one of the best experiences in my life. Now, I didn't like the Army. I mean, they, they didn't, they weren't kind, you know. I mean, I, they, I slept on a, a, a little wire bunk, and it was noisy, a lot of people in, the, in there, and it was very noisy. And uh, they tell you what to do constantly. Uh, they don't let you do what you want to do. You have to do what they want you to do. Well, all this went on. And I didn't like them at the time. But I wouldn't give a million bucks for that experience. Uh, I, I gave maybe two million bucks. It was, it, it, that's when Fred Packard sort of grew up a little bit at the time. And my experiences were uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, I had enough time to go all over Western Europe. I didn't get to go to Eastern Europe until 10 years ago because of the Iron Curtain. But uh, I went all over Western Europe and had some wonderful experiences. I got to sit around on the quay de la Tournelle, uh, which is right behind Notre Dame. Is that right, Mate? I think that's where it was. And uh, do watercolors and drawings. I got to do some watercolors and drawings in Rome when I had pneumonia and was at the uh, Salvador Torre International Hospital. And um, just a host of, of things. Some that uh, well, and, and were, Fred, in, were enlightening. How did you get involved in photography in the service? I forgot about it. That's what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> well, it was excellent background, so. Well, I, I, I ate up the whole uh, evening with the background. <laughs> no, it was no, good. No, I'll tell you how I got involved. Um, I, I, could, I didn't have a camera or anything, and I bought a little of... Uh, uh, leaf shutter camera, Fortlander, and didn't know how to use it. And um, we had a shack over on the south side of the post. We were out in the middle of the piney woods surrounded by 
uh, vineyards. We, I was in the heart of uh, the, um, I forget things, the, the red wine district. What's the famous? Burgundy? Hmm? Burgundy? Burg uh, no, not Burgundy. Bordeaux. Bordeaux. How can you forget something like that? And, and we were surrounded by vineyards all around, and you know, we had uh, Saint Emilion and Medoc and wonderful wines all around us. And um, in the middle of, of that, we had what was called uh, a, uh, a POL depot. That's oil and gas stuff that we stored. We got it off the uh, no decks exercise. We got it. Uh, we were right by the, the Bay of Biscay and the ships would pull in and we'd get this stuff and store it. And uh, we had enough stuff there to blow up Europe. But um, not just uh, oil and gas is what we supposedly had for the combat troops in Germany, but uh, there were other things. There was what's called CPR and there was um, combat uh, uh, poison gas and stuff like that. And um, back in there, we, we had the Polish guards. They weren't all Polish. They were displaced persons, Czechoslovakian and Polish and Hungarian. There were a lot of those. So we would hire those to be our guards to guard this stuff because we were in the heart of a communist uh, area of France. And um, <clears throat> there's a little shack back in there where people would go and process film and make prints. And they were usually very bad prints because there wasn't anybody, an instructor or anything. But there was a, a Polish man there about 50 years old named Frank, I remember. I don't know what his real name was. And um, he sort of looked after me and he taught me how to process film and how to make a real print. Uh, quality print. And this, I came to understand this was in a program in the Army called Special Services. But um, anyway, uh, that's how I started taking pictures. And I was minding my own business and all that. Uh, and um, one of the officers from headquarters came and tapped me and said, uh, we need you to take over as post photographer. And I was just a, a fledgling in this, you know, uh, because the post photographer uh, left and uh, we have nobody to take pictures. Well, I jumped on that and um, found myself shooting for the Army as well as for myself. And uh, I had some stuff published in... Um, um, Stars and Stripes was the official newspaper of the, all the military. And had some pictures published in there. And these were just shots I made of, you know, people standing on streets or fishermen mending their nets at La Rochelle and things, things of that nature. Um, brand new imagery for me. And um, I got an offer from a magazine in Paris called um, um, American Weekend. It was for American tourists and so forth, uh, wanting me to uh, go to work for them when I got out. And they said they would pay me a good salary and I could travel all over Europe uh, with an expense account. But. Uh, I had the idea that I somehow had to come back to LSU and finish. And uh, I turned down that job, and it, it worked out okay. Um, well, that's how I got started in photography. Well, and, and so that's how you got started in photography. You also have a, a long history of, you know, as evidenced by your artist statement I read, being connected to the land in which you inhabit. And so can you tell us about the 
the linkage to photography, but then also to other media, like this graphite and oil crayon piece from your Petite Landscape uh, series. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I mentioned that I, I uh, wasn't able to paint when I was overseas in the Army because we only had a foot locker and a wall locker. So I had a little tray of watercolors, and, and I could also draw with pencil and ink. And uh, I got back home, and uh, by the way, these pictures uh, span about 65 or 70 years. So, uh, and there's no, there's no real sense of connectivity from one to the other. Um, so uh, if it looks like the, uh, uh, the stylization, what happens is you look at one of these pictures and it may be next to it one thirty years apart or 50 years apart or uh, 20 years apart. And uh, as Ben said, I, I was very close to the land growing up and started, started drawing when I was very, very small. And um, I seemed to have a penchant for uh, landscapes. I went through a period about uh, 10 to 20 years ago when I was still mobile. Uh, doing landscapes, doing paintings of uh, uh, things right here around uh, South Louisiana. And uh, there's still some oils. I have a few oil paints on, on paintings on canvas. Um, but a lot of, a uh, whole lot of drawings in, uh, in color and in black and white. and. I think I have one of those, maybe a couple here. Um, oh, here we go. I was living in Sunset for a while, and this was one of the many, many dozens and dozens of landscapes. This little petite landscape is here somewhere. It's not very big, huh? It's right over your shoulder behind you. It's not so big. But some of them were tiny. They, it might be one of those little bitty ones here somewhere, a little bitty landscape. And uh, I, loved, I loved to do those, those landscapes. Uh, most of them are gone. Uh, at the time, I managed to sell quite a few and uh, traded, uh, traded several uh, to a, a, what do you call the doctors that fix gums, ginger? You know what I'm talking about, dentists. Anyway, traded them for things like $1,100 bill to f fix my gums and my teeth. So I used them that way too. <coughs> but, I, but I gave a lot of those away. <coughs> and I still have a lot of them crowding me out at home. <coughs> but, you know, the, there's also a, a, an, an urge to tell stories within the, within the context of your work. And, you know, and I think your personal narrative informs that a great deal in general because you're documenting, um, but you're also <coughs> experiencing. And so, you know, works like Orphan Toys, Abandoned at Old Store, the, the photograph of all the dolls piled up. Oh, the how dolls. Does, how does that kind of work? Uh, well, the dolls. How does that uh, communicate with the landscape? A lot of people don't like the dolls. Where, where are the dolls? Are they here? Yep. I was looking at a print of them the last couple of days. It's over there, huh? Oh, there they are. Um, the print I have at home on the wall is, is more saturated with tone. It's darker. And it's, I think it's more successful than this one. I wish I had brought the other one because it reinforced the mood better. But uh, this one tends to be a little bit too light to my notion. But um, I've gotten a lot of reaction to that particular image. Uh, people don't like it. And uh, I can understand why they don't like it uh, because I don't like it either. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, uh, it reminds me, you know, effigies, human effigies, I think, uh, play that role all the time. Dolls are scary, clowns are scary, things like that. And uh, this one in particular reminds me of the obvious. Um, the Holocaust, for example, is one example. Uh, Auschwitz, uh, Belsen, Belsen, and uh, Dachau. I worked, I worked in, uh, after I got out of the Army, I worked with special services in Germany for several years. And one of the very first places I was assigned to was Dachau. And I took my sons, Chris there and Jason, uh, I took them over one Christmas. We had a whole month off. And I took them to Europe, and we rented a car, and we went all over. And I took them to Dachau, and I took them at a time in the winter when the snow was gray and repulsive. And we visited the the whole thing, the ovens, you know, the shacks they were, lived in, uh, the hooks on the wall, all those things. And uh, this image reminded me of what happened uh, in the Holocaust. But it also reminded me of an assignment that the Army gave me when I first became a photographer for the Army. And that was a, they sent me to Bergerac. You remember Cyrano? He wasn't there, it was uh, three or 400 years ago or something. But they sent me for some reason to Bergerac and uh, there was a commune, they called them communes. We had them here for a while back in hippie days. Um, but uh, there was a commune there in Bergerac uh, run by the French government and it took care of people that were disenfranchised in all kinds of ways. Uh, old people, young people, babies, toddlers, everything. And they were set up in, in different buildings. Um, and I was uh, touring when I got there. There was a lady assigned to me, a social worker. And she uh, took me from one building to the other. And um, we went into a building that had something in it that was so horrible that I couldn't photograph anymore. That was the end of me photographing that day. It was a shock. And uh, the, the people in it, and what the condition they were in, and I'm not gonna go into detail, I'll just tell you what, how it affected me. And I, I think I had a kind of a, a uh, an experience anyway from that, from seeing that that's commensurate with what I felt when I was in these places in Germany and uh, Poland and that stuck with me uh, all these years and I think that's why I have such a dark side. I have a light side too, but I have a dark side. And it comes out in some of my work and my writings, my poetry. Uh, it's there. It's definitely there. <laughs> But so, it's relieved by people like you. I mean, you know, I see some wonderful faces here today, and, and I feel really good. Well, and speaking of wonderful faces and that juxtaposition between the light and the dark, I think that you took some really meaningful photos in Mexico City. For example, on the screen, Beautiful Child, Mexico City. Oh, yeah, the children. How does, so how does that travel experience juxtapose to the one you just described? 
Yeah. Uh, uh, my wife and I were down there, and it was uh, Cinco de Mayo, and it was in the uh, Zocalo in front of the cathedral in the big square. Some of you have been there, and you know what I'm talking about. And it's crowded with people, thousands of people. And I walked up and saw these children decorated like that. And I just had a wonderful time. And they were so responsive. I mean, they didn't turn away, you know. They, they competed in the, in the experience. There's this one. I have another one, I think. Is there a second one? Maybe that one. Yeah. There's a companion piece over there. At the bottom, yeah. Well, Mexico was a totally different experience, uh, obviously, from Europe. It was a totally different thing. And I spent time not just in the cities and in the towns like some of these. And that picture right there, in fact, it, lo it looks a street scene I've seen in movies and uh, so forth. Um, and the, the wood-carved masks as well? The what? The wood-carved masks as well? Yeah, where are they? There, there's a large image on the screen right oh, there. Yeah. That's the, Tara, uh, the Tarahumara Indians. And this was down in uh, the Barranca del Cobre, uh, Copper Canyon. And uh, I spent time down there with my friend, my very, very close friend and mentor. You heard of Bob Wiggs? He was a character. And he and I were down in, uh, way down in Copper Canyon. And uh, we spent some time among the Tarahumara Indians. And they would uh, carve these in wood. As you can see, they're very, very expressive uh, things. Um, and he, they were carved in wood. And they would bring those into the markets. Uh, this particular group. Uh, were shot in Lagunitas in the, uh, the edge of um, Mexico City. And uh, Helen and I, my wife and I were down there and roaming around when I spotted those. And I had seen them down in the, down in the canyon uh, when I was down there. Uh, that, was, that was quite an experience. Uh, well, and, and Fred, how did you bring these experiences and your interest in, in painting and photography as well, how did you bring that to your students as an educator? Oh, the only way I could bring it to them was just keeping an open mind. Um, I, I uh, found out, after I started teaching a while, I found out that... Uh, uh, it was not my job as an art teacher to impose on my students. Uh, it's, it's awfully hard. I, I didn't believe in grading. I hated grading. I know you, I see some of my colleagues know what I'm talking about because how are you gonna grade a piece of art? A piece of art is an expression of, of your soul. You know, if it's a genuine piece of art, you put it out there for people to see and to understand. And I had trouble, always had trouble with grading. But uh, by just keeping an open mind, uh, I allowed the students to bring their experiences into the, into the picture. And uh, I don't know how else to answer that. Well, um, did you encourage them to follow in your steps in terms of traveling and, and being out in the world as a practicing artist, or did you not want to imprint a specific kind of pattern on them? Oh, I think, I think that because of my loquacious nature and the fact that I inherited from my father this... Uh, tendency to talk too much and tell stories. I think some of that wore off when I was working with the kids. I call them kids. They're hell of the kids to me. But um, 
I think I think it wore off uh, without me doing it overtly, you know. Mm. I see. Very good. And and from the standpoint of, you know, I, I think my understanding of your generation of artists, there is definitely an interest in working seriously in many media, and there's a little less. Uh, focus on a specialty like granted of course you had a specialty but I associate your generation with artists that pursued very seriously many different pursuits and we're talking about there not necessarily being a through line and you have this urge to create and and make kind of depending on the circumstances and I think there's an interesting instance of that with fishing boats uh, at the seashore in Cannes? You oh, know, that yeah. blue postcard that you made. Can you talk a little bit about kind of following your inspiration as an artist? Well, that fishing boats, oh yeah, that's a, about a five minute thing that my daughter Nicole and I were, um, uh, it was during the summer when I was teaching over there a couple of summers with Bate and others. And uh, uh, Nicole and I uh, took the train over from Jean Le Pen, Antibes, where we were at that time, and uh, uh, we were in Cannes. And uh, we wandered into a little place there to get a, a soft drink, so, uh, ice cream or something. I think you're losing your microphone. Wandered into this little place, and there was some, uh, I wanted to do a drawing things were happening here, you know, looking out outside. I wanted to do a drawing, but I didn't have any paper. I failed to bring drawing paper with me. And there were these little uh, flyers advertising a rock and roll band that night in some bistro or something there. And I picked up a handful of those and did, wound up doing a number of these little quick sketches and uh, as I said that's probably I probably should have stayed with those five minute sketches because that one came off I think I, I, that's one of my favorites uh, it's definitely one of my favorites as well I see it over there I think yeah you know I think it exemplifies how you just follow your inspiration. But I also feel over the course of your career, you've followed technology. You know, as camera technology develops, you have been an early adopter of, of new technologies. Even with your, your newest work, um, the Looking Down series, and I, there's one up on the screen right now from 2019, you're shooting now with an iPhone 10, and so can you talk a little bit about your, the way in which you've always been adopting new technology as an artist? Yeah, um, well, after I was over there a little while, uh, uh, working in Germany, um, I had access to uh, to uh, all kinds of equipment and everything, and I'm looking. I'm looking at the one of the uh, railroad tracks, mm. which now belongs to my son and his wife. But uh, uh, I would use a particular camera for a particular kind of uh, image, a need, and uh, a lot of these were done with a small 35 millimeter camera because it was easy to carry and a single lens reflex as we called them. And uh, some of them were shot with more uh, sophisticated cameras like the little one of, uh, at the bottom there of the Austrian village in the mountains. A shot with a Hasselblad, which I, I didn't own, it was a government issue. And um, then, um, as I got older and so forth and, and didn't move around, 
I wound up like so many other people uh, using, using a, an iPhone, which has the, count, the lens built in there. And uh, I just started using the iPhone. And um, I got into a phase, uh, probably some of those I can't tell from here back there, a phase of uh, looking down, I called it, because there, there was so much richness going on below us that we don't, we don't uh, appreciate and look at. And uh, these, uh, I, had a, uh, I had a little rule, and that rule was don't arrange anything as you see it, as you find it. Nature arranged it. It happened. But I recognized it. And I want to uh, uh, emphasize that. Uh, that's a, a thing that I adopted when I was teaching and using photography mainly for, and that was teaching my students how to see. Now that may have come about because I only had that one eye to see with, but it, seeing became extremely important to me. And uh, I emphasized that with my students. We did things in not only in photography, but uh, in drawing and so forth to try to uh, get the kids to, uh, to not just look at things, but to see critically, like critical thinking, but this is critical seeing. And I mean, what could be more beautiful than that? I think, you know, something that was just arranged, that have, fortuitous, it was there. But if you stumbled over it and didn't pay attention, it wasn't there. And I got into a, a pattern of doing this. I think, we, I don't know how many we had. We have four or five more of these over there? I think there, I think there is seven over there on view seven. in that grouping, yeah. Yeah. I kind of let uh, uh, Ben help me pick out things. Uh, uh, he, he did a great job, and I want to uh, uh, share my appreciation to him and to his um, assistants that uh, worked on this show, the hanging of it and the selection. And, uh, I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate what you're doing tonight. And you, fix, you folks over there on the uh, cameras and the other equipment. It's very nice of you. Well, I, I think with a, with a sense of a overview of your role as an educator, how you came to photography in the military, and that really set you down a path. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know if, you know, we've given a, a broad overview. Are there any specific questions from the audience that you'd like addressed um, from the, what you've been able to see of the exhibition um, at this point? Oh, an anecdote. Okay, here, let me. Uh, My, my father worked uh, for special services for the Army after his, his uh, service. And um, he would drive around Europe, drive around Germany, and set up uh, art projects for Army soldiers, which my brother and I always thought was a load of crap. Uh, we always thought he worked for the CIA. Uh, because the United States Army is going to pay money to send a to send a former serviceman driving around Europe and drinking wine and painting so that he can set up these little set up these little art projects for for US soldiers and uh, he even had a government ID that got him through a few traffic incidents with the German police because they thought he worked for the for the spooks <laughs> but he swears that he never was a CIA agent so we only know after after he's he's gone and the truth comes out anyway well the uh thing it's not something you can talk about uh, <laughs> but uh, um um 
Ma'am? You tell us, do they have to kill you? It's not my yeah, No, you don't have to kill me, but um, okay. you, it's just uh, something that you uh, don't talk about. I'll say this, that what I did is a, I called us a crafts director. Um, crafts and photography, and I, I did. I had, a, I had a bunch of shops to supervise in Germany. I started with seven up in the uh, heart of the Alps in southern Bavaria, and then they moved me into Munich and expanded my territory all the way from Salzburg to Oberammergau, and I wound up with 22 shops. Now, that's an expansive area in the mountains, in the Alps, beautiful, beautiful. Some of you have been there and you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> but it gives you tremendous opportunity to do different things, you know? You keep your good eye open, I'll put it that way. Well, and, and when you came back from Europe, I think that one element we hadn't discussed is how you how did you come to complete your education on your way to becoming a, an educator and a professor? Oh, to complete my education. Well, I don't know. I did some some things uh, in the in the uh, army that I wouldn't have done otherwise. Like they sent me to the Leica school. Uh, some of you are familiar with Leica cameras. Uh, the Lights Camera Company in Wetzlar, Germany, and they sent me there at free of charge. Uh, nice room, uh, food. Uh, and my instructor, by the way, was Herr Kraut. And uh, that was, was good. And uh, other avenues besides college, you mean? Well, I went to the... Uh, I, I think a lot of people considered it passe, but it was perfect for me at the time. I went to the Art Students League for a while when I came back from the Army and uh, uh, took drawing and painting while I was there in New York City. And uh, then um, there's something else. I've forgotten. They contributed. Besides college. I don't know. Well, and, and so, does anyone have any other anecdotes to help me fill out my own research dossier for the museum um, before the, we, uh, we conclude the evening and we can carry on? If you, if you do have a question, you you didn't want to ans ask in, in public. The, Fred will be here, of course, and and you can converse with him. But was there any last uh, observation or question for Fred? Oh, great. Here, let's get you on record. I apologize. This is not an anecdote. It is a question. Um, so you uh, made a statement saying um, not to look, but to really see. So what advice would you give to somebody who's not an artist to see critically, as you said? Dude, let, let me, um, advice, what kind of advice is she asking? Uh, advice for non-artists to look more critically at, the vis at, at things visually. Hmm. I don't know, that's a good one. Uh, for non-artists, because so many uh, non-artists are prejudiced. That's the truth, uh, you know, about, I like, I like this and it, um, why do you like it? Well, I just like it, you know. That's the way it is. And they, they are not uh, willing to open their mind and look at, at uh, various things and get caught up, maybe get caught up in, in, uh, in their vision. Uh, I think uh, just keep an open mind is the only thing I could say. Uh, that's it. 
Um, for those of <laughs> I'm having trouble. One have a love of life and a good outlook, but for those people that are not inclined to see as you do, Fred, um, people are too much in a rush. People don't take time for anything, hardly. Hardly to take time to have a friend. You need to focus. You need to slow down. You need to observe more. Like a little flower, a little wildflower is so beautiful, yet no one sees that. A friend is so wonderful, but no one sees that. They're too much in a hurry. So I think slow down, observe, cherish the little things around you. You'll be surprised at what you really see and not look. She had oh. something to say. I was just going to say something about uh, many years ago uh, when I was uh, taking a class with Mr. Packard. Fred was really good about giving people assignments. And he has some really good assignments. Uh, just this one particular assignment, I was having just the hardest time with it. I was shooting and I was really trying to get this story down. And I'll, I'll never forget, I walked into his office one day and I said, Fred, I just can't do this project. I said, I've been trying. I showed him some of the stuff I was doing. I said, but my heart's just not in it. So he says, well, what, what's, what's going on? What's, uh, what are you passionate about? And I told him, well, I've been playing around with this stuff for the last few months, whatever, and I started showing him something that was completely different from what he was, he was assigning us. It was, uh, the assignment was more of a photojournalism type of assignment. And I was doing something that was maybe much, uh, maybe a little more experimental of utilizing multiple images in a, uh, in a, in a print. So, and Fred just looked at me and said, just go with it. He says, you know, I give assignments for those that can't figure out what to do or something like that. And he says, but he said, you're on the first step to being an artist. You've made your own assignment. So, yeah, that's my little anecdote about, anecdote about that. Thanks, Ralph. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I see this as an inkjet print shot with iPhone X. <laughs> I mean, I think, or five, you know. But anyway, I just, 10. I just, um, I, I'm thinking, you know, I'm not really an artist, like he was saying, but I'm going to uh, France in uh, next year, and I was thinking, well, you know, I can do some art too. You, you've inspired me. <laughs> so I want to thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. And I, I think there's one last person here. I was never privileged to be your student, but I know I know you also had a way with the students, and and maybe you got it from doing this craft work in the military. Like you had a coffee pot, and 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 there was some sense of community in the photography department. Can you did you learn that by being in Europe? Is that where you honed that skill? It was a skill. Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Melville. Melville. Oh, from Melville. <laughs> Melville is where I grew up. By the way, it is now a ghost town. And it's very uh, disheartening to go. I don't go there anymore because uh, it's dead, and I, I, I just heard yesterday, I think it was, that Can I Tell a Store, which was a famous store in South Louisiana, died, it went out of business. After, I remember when I was a little kid and I'd go there and things, they still kept crackers and barrels and things, you know. It, it was 
70, 80, 80 years ago, 80 years ago, I'm 88 now, and uh, I was a little kid, and uh, it, it was a special place to go to, but that's over. Everything's over. Melville was a fishing village. It started as a fishing village in the 1880s. And it was uh, when I, it was an exciting, believe it or not, exciting place to grow up. We had the best music program in, in probably South Louisiana, believe it or not. And uh, uh, we had three hotels, and we had the Joy Theater, believe it or not. All these things in this tiny little town. But uh, all of that's gone now. It's sad to think about it. Well, look, I have enjoyed, uh, know, well, Jason, what? I just wanted to mention how some of the startups in art, because you painted signs in Melville. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, that's kind of sad to think about, because my signs are still on, on the bars and the hotels and things there. <laughs> but I did. I, I painted, I started painting when I was about 13, and the... Uh, uh, there's a place called Dick Blick uh, Sign Painting Equipment in Galesburg, Illinois. I don't know why. That's the kind of information that you store away and it's meaningless, but it comes back. And uh, I ordered a, a sign painting kit and taught myself to paint signs. And it uh, came in real handy. I was even painting some signs when I was in college. And, in graduate school in Ohio, I was still painting signs. I hate it. <laughs> well, Fred, thank you for coming and spending the evening with us. And please, everyone, uh, thank Fred with a round of applause. Now let me clap for you. Thank you so much for coming and, and for letting me see your faces, wonderful faces, and most of you I recognize and some of you I would like to know. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I appreciate your invitation to come and I appreciate you coming out. And it's uh, very uh, important when you're stuck at home all the time and not a lot of excitement, but it's important to uh, do this once in a while to associate with people. And uh, it's been a pleasure to see you and talk to you. Thank you. <laughs>